All right. Welcome, everybody. We will, we're here tonight for the City Council Committee of the Whole, August 9th. We'll have uh, the clerk call the roll, please. Brereton? Here. Flurry? Present. Frank? Here. Freeman is absent. McGee? Here. Mahal? Here. Porter? Here. Prather? Here. Snow? Uh, here. Stevens? Here. Nine present. Thank you. So under uh, public comment, we have uh, Richard Wainwright here tonight. Richard, you want to come up to the microphone, please? How are you tonight? I'm here. How are you? Good. You? Good. Good. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak again tonight. I was here a while back uh, with a problem on the S about the S curve on Chrysler Drive, the weeds, the trees, the whole thing. Well, it's been rectified. The weeds are cut, the trees are pushed back, dirt was brought in, graded, seeded, and it's starting to come up. How long did it take you? Uh, took a uh, long time. <laughs> I would encourage all of you to take a drive by there just to see what it looks like now. The people in that area, both from the subdivision and the townhomes, I have trouble getting anything done because they're all coming by, you know, with comments about how good it looks. I, they want to thank me. I tell them no. Come thank you guys because you're the ones that did it. Mr. Anderson's crew was terrific. I wouldn't mind having them work on any project I had. So that's all I have. Thank you very much and please come and visit us. Thank you, Mr. Wainwright, and thank you for coming back up here. Usually we only hear a follow up to complaints, we usually don't hear uh, some of the good stuff. So appreciate your time. Appreciate you taking the time to come back here and let us know that we're doing a good job. And thank you, Brent. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, under public comment, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, earlier today, we had had a gentleman's 100th birthday. Um, you may have read about her. You may have heard about it. Um, Robert Bob Salcedo. He um, turned 100 today. Uh, he, was a, he is a World War II veteran. And we honored him today um, at the American Legion uh, with a parade out to his home at Four Seasons. Um, just a little bit about Mr. Salcedo. He, um, he was on the USS Ashtabula, which was hit by a Japanese torpedo on October 24, 1943. And he was awarded five battle stars for his actions during World War II. Um, he did. He does have a birthday today. He turns 100, which is significant. And um, so, I was able to go out there today. Um, one of the be the best things that I've done since I've been in this chair. And um, but we had had a proclamation for Mr. Salcedo, so I read this and presented it to him on behalf of the city. And I'll read it. I'll read it here again. If uh, Mr. Salcedo, Robert Salcedo, or his family are watching. Again, um, congratulations on, and uh, happy birthday to you, and thank you for your service. So the proclamation reads, whereas Robert Salcedo has achieved a milestone of 100 years of age on August 9, 2021, and whereas Mr. Salcedo became the husband to Nell Salcedo in 1941, the love of his life, and this marriage blessed his family with one daughter and one granddaughter, and whereas Mr. Salcedo has lived during the most eventful century of this world's history, whereas Mr. Salcedo contributed to the defense of our country during World War II by serving in the United States Navy, and whereas Mr. Salcedo was awarded five battle stars for his actions during World War II, and whereas Mr. Salcedo 
His career continued as a mechanic for Oscar Mayer, where he dedicated over 40 years of his life. And whereas today we gather to celebrate the fact that Robert has graced those around him with 100 years of life, spirit, and joy, and whereas the city of Belvedere recognizes and commends Mr. Salcedo for serving our great country and serving this community with his presence and kindness. Now therefore, I, Clinton Morris, Mayor of Belvedere, do hereby take official note of the joyous occasion for Mr. Salcedo's 100th birthday, and so hereby proclaim August 9th, 2021 uh, to be Robert Salcedo Day. So thank you very much. Happy birthday to Mr. Salcedo. We appreciate your service and I hope you have many more. Uh, item number one, reports of officers, boards and special committees, uh, public works, works on finished business, stormwater utility implement, implementation phasing was tabled uh, August 10th of 2020 so on your desk tonight there is a copy of the minutes from that August 10th 2020 meeting uh, specifically uh, item number F uh, stormwater utility implementation phasing uh, there was a motion by Alderman Arevalo second by Alderman Stevens to approve the task to outreach portion of the proposal from Fairgram in an amount not to exceed $37,190. That work will be paid for from line item 415-110-7900. And then there was the motion to table that uh, first motion, which was passed. So at this point in time, if committee would like to further discuss this item, we will need to remove that from the table. Okay. We have a motion by Alderman Snow, a second by Alderwoman Prather to remove uh, off of the table the stormwater utility implementation phasing. Excuse me. And uh, we will do a roll call for that. Uh, is there any other? Uh, go ahead. Clerk will call the roll. Those in favor say aye. Are those opposed, nay? Brereton? Aye. Flurry? Aye. Frank? Aye. McGee? Aye. Mulhall? Aye. Porter? Aye. Prather? Aye. Snow? Aye. Stevens? Aye. Nine in favor? Thank you. So this is off of the table. Brent, uh, do you have anything that you wanted to add here? Sure. So we had a discussion at our, at our previous meeting. Um, Mr. Mackey from Fairgram was here to give a short presentation, a little history lesson for everybody on where we were at. And also included at your desk tonight is a copy of the memo from one year ago uh, regarding the implementation phasing. And I'll just review that quickly. Fairgram and their subconsultant Wood Environment and Infrastructure Solutions has completed and submitted the stormwater utility feasibility, feasibility study to the city. The study concluded that it is feasible that a stormwater utility in the city may be adopted. The study also outlined an impl implementation plan for establishing the stormwater utility. That feasibility uh, study was $48,370. The current budget includes $100,000 for the implementation of a stormwater utility for the city of Belvedere. And attached to the memo is a proposal from Fairgram in an amount not to exceed $95,560. The proposal itemizes, itemizes the costs associated with each of the tasks identified in the implementation plan. The next phase in this process would be the public outreach to educate the residents and gather their feedback on the function of a stormwater utility prior to the city council's final decision on implementing a stormwater utility. I would recommend approval of the task to outreach portion of the proposal from Fairgram in an amount not to exceed $37,190. And this work will be paid for from line item 415-110-7900. I would add that the $100,000 uh, is still remaining in the current budget for stormwater implementation. The tasks identified are still the same. The costs to complete those tasks are still the same. So at this point, um, we're back to where we were one year ago. Okay. Thank you, Brent. <coughs> so <coughs> do we have a motion to that effect so we can have discussion regarding that? I think there's already been a motion and a second of him, correct? Correct, it was just tabled. Do you want the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, okay. So we have a motion and a second uh, to bring it off of the 
Oh, that's off the table, isn't it? Okay. So there was a there was a motion made there was a motion made um, to pro to approve task two outreach portion of the proposal from Fairgram in an amount not to exceed thirty seven one ninety. Okay, and do we want a motion then, explicitly for that or prior prior to the discussion? It was by an alderman that's not here anymore. Oh, okay, so it okay. okay, okay, okay. So it's discussion time. Okay. Anybody have any thoughts? Alderman Breda. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just for clarification, so it's $37,190 to inform the public, is that correct? Yes, there are steps outlined, and I can let Mr. Mackey speak to that a little bit more. Um, it would be a multi-pronged uh, approach. Um, and the, the, the fees, uh, the um, equivalent ERUs, equivalent residential units, um, would be the mechanism used to determine cost for our residents. Um, and so we would be contacting, the plan would be to contact our five largest land users because it is a, ba a land-based system uh, for stormwater to calculate stormwater runoff and their impacts. Uh, so it would be the process of sitting down, uh, meeting with those five largest property owners in town to get their input on their feelings on the subject as well as put together brochures, informational packet for uh, to send out to all the residents so they are informed on what a stormwater utility would actually do and not do and what would make up the utility. Thank you, Director. Just sounds expensive. It is. Anybody else? Uh, Alderman Frank, then Alderman Porter. Thank you, Mayor. Is there another way that we can go about this that isn't ex is expensive? Can we do like a public notification or do we have to do it the way you're talking about mailing them? Well, I think it's gonna be an effort. I guess it depends on the council's direction and if they are, if they would like to see the utility implemented or, or not implemented, I think is a factor of of the work effort that you would do to educate the public on what it is and what it isn't. Um, I think it's, um, the approach that was taken, I think is a well-rounded approach. Um, getting the input from your largest stakeholders is I think uh, very important to see what their opinion is on it and uh, get their feelings on that. Um, certainly we could do we could do less and get the input, and then the council can make the decision. It's basically a council's call on, on um, how you wish us to proceed at this point. Alderman Burden. Thanks again, Mayor. Uh, um, yeah, so, so reaching out to those companies, uh, you know, I'm just trying to uh, stay away from spending so much money. So couldn't we just reach out to those companies without spending forty thousand dollars? We could go back to Fairgram and and uh, talk to them and further break down the public education and report back to committee as to um, what makes up that thirty seven thousand dollar figure and um, then you could advise us of where you want to pick and choose within that to do what uh, you guys would ultimately decide the direction for us to do. We can certainly do that. Alderman Porter. Well, just one thing that I, <clears throat> I kind of said this from the beginning that uh, the only rate that I'd really be in favor of this is if it goes on a referendum and, you know, let the public decide on this one. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Porter. We've had, uh, Brent, how much rain did we get today? What, four inches? Did we get four? Well, uh, those reports, it's preliminary yet. Still, those reports are still coming in. Uh, I've heard seven. I've heard uh, the first round that we had earlier today was two to four. I've heard about the same amount for the second round. Um, but I've heard anywhere from, like I said, earlier three to four inches. Uh, I heard one report of seven inches. Uh, for this total between the two storms. Uh, so we've had a good amount of rain in a short period of time. And uh, do we have any kind of a post-mortem on that yet at all? Not yet. Um, I can tell you that the areas that we typically see standing water uh, flooding, if you will, um, saw them uh, for a short period of time. 
Uh, I think it was impacted anywhere from 3, 30, 4 o'clock, right around that time frame. By 5 o'clock, most of the areas were down. I can tell you that the high school pond, um, from what I, my experience has been, had more water in it now than it has that I've seen in the past. Uh, we, have, we almost filled that up, which is a good thing because that's what the improvements out there were meant to do. Corresponding with that, the water down at Lower Sheffield, um, not Lower Sheffield, but Bellwood, uh, was actually to the curbs, a little bit higher than the curbs. It was below the sidewalks, which is a good thing because typically if we had that much rain as we had today in a short period of time, it would have been more severe there. So I think that's a direct correlation of the improvements that were made in that area. Um, East Avenue, the, the two areas on East Avenue where water usually tops the roadway, tops the, top the roadway there up uh, past the sidewalk. Uh, typically known what's known as the overland flow route. When the pipes and everything get inundated, uh, then Mother Nature takes the course uh, based on elevation, and, and that course was followed. Um, Caswell um, had water, Warren had water across the road. Um, but it was interesting when we got down to the 4th Street lift station area, um, and usually that intersection is underwater, that intersection was dry. Um, the Chrysler Drive area that the gentleman talked about earlier today that had water above the curve, but it stayed, I don't think it got as high as the sidewalk. Uh, it came close though, so that was in a day for a short period of time, but we didn't even have to put barricades out on Chrysler Drive, which we typically usually do. So I think the southeast part of town got hit the hardest, um, and the rest of the town not, not so bad, which is a good thing. Thank you. So. With that being said, is there any other comment or discussion, Alderman Snow? So, obviously, we do need to get things rolling. The longer we put this off, because this is from last year, um, we need to move forward on this. Um, I'm going to vote yes on the expenditure. And in the meantime, if Brent does want to go out and get more isolated um, pricing on each of the phases, so we can pick and choose if we decide to move forward potentially but we need to move forward this needs to get done and unfortunately we do need to get this implemented i understand the alderman's um, idea about the referendum um, but at this point i think you're going to find the people on the south side would say yes and the people on the north side would say no and that's going to leave you in a conundrum of not having a majority vote potentially so um, and it needs to be fixed. So I'm going to vote yes. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Alderman Burden. Thanks again, Mayor. So in contrast to Alderman Snow's comments, um, Director Anderson um, said that he could talk to the companies before we went ahead with this. So would the proper motion to make, would it be to table this again, attorney, or what would we do? Well, you could further pending further information. Um, if I may, Mr. Mayor, I guess I'm confused. Do we not know what the itemization for the scope of work is? Well, the, uh, the, the scope of work was broken down into eight tasks, mm -hmm. and task number uh, two being the outreach effort component of those tasks. And that cost was allocated to be 37190 What I indicated was we could go back to Fairgram and their subconsultant and break down that further break down that 37,000 number and and see what that included what that didn't include and share that information back with council and then council could provide direction if they only wanted to do a b c and d of the, that portion or a, a reduced scope if you will of that outreach so if the, if the committee wishes to get that information before they vote on this issue yes you could table it you don't need a motion direct Director Anderson to do that, he could just do it. But if, if that's the information you're wanting and you let him know that, then I guess yeah, it'd be appropriate or he could table it again so he get you that information. Um, but that's up to the committee. Alderman Bird. Well, then I'll make a motion to table this until we, again, until we get further information. I, Your Honor, I, I had my hand up okay. before he threw that in there. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Okay. We have a second. Motion and a second. Uh, motion to table. Second. Uh, all those in favor to table for further information from the Public Works Director, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. May I recommend a roll call vote? We have a roll call vote, please. <coughs> Flurry? Aye. Frank? Aye. 
Mickey? Aye. Mulhall? Aye. Porter? Aye. Prather? Aye. Snow? No. Stevens? Aye. Brereton? Aye. Eight in favor? Okay, motion passed the table. Brent, uh, when you get that itemized broke down, uh, then the committee will readdress it. Yeah, hopefully I'll have it uh, ready for their next committee meeting. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, item two, public works, new business. Uh, Brent, update. A couple items to update council on. Um, first one being our Logan Avenue plans have been approved by IDOT. Uh, a modified or a reduced scope of the copy of those plans that are at your desk tonight. Just for reference, so everybody has, uh, at least can refer back to uh, uh, probably the main components of those plans if needed. Uh, the bid opening for this project is scheduled for January 18th of 2022. Uh, there are five street lights that our city own that our Public Works Department will be relocating uh, this fall as part of that project. ComEd, ComEd has approximately 25 utility poles that they will be relocating at the start of this project. Uh, we will be scheduling a public information meeting in open house prior to the start of the project also. That'll probably occur, be occurring in the early springtime. Um, and the anticipation is we, by the time we've got the approval from IDOT on the plans, we felt it was too late to put the project out to bid at this point in time with the construction schedule season starting to wind down. Uh, mm -hmm. We think it's going to be most advantageous for us pricing wise, scheduling wise as well as to be, be right out of the bat uh, first thing in the spring. So that's what we've uh, set this up to be. So hopefully all work will be done and completed during next year's construction season. Uh, also the lease demolition um, is scheduled to, contractor is scheduled to start that uh, on August 16th, the week of August 16th. Uh, so Meadow Street from Caswell Street to M Nebraska Street will be closed to traffic uh, from August 16th to August 20th. Uh, to allow for that demolition work, a contractor estimates that it'll take him about a week to get the building down, the portion of the building that is co coming down, and then it'll be a period of time also to do the cleanup and everything, site restoration, so forth, um, uh, once the building is actually down. Um, per the bid specifications, uh, the finished product that he will be with will, will leave a, basically a, depressed, a three foot depression in that area of where the building was to allow us then to, to cap the site. So we'll have more information on the capping uh, to follow in the upcoming meetings as far as uh, the process to get that done as well. Um, so that's where we are on the Leith demolition. Hey Brent, how, what timeline are they looking for that demo to be completed, do you know? Well, it'll be a week to have the building actually down and then depends on whether and not to have the site removed and cleaned up. So I would say it's probably gonna be another two weeks maybe three weeks for them to actually get everything crunched up. And because uh, with the asbestos and stuff that was noted, everything's gotta be lined, everything's gotta be watered, watered to keep the dust down. Um, so there's some parameters there that they will have to go through. Um, so I'm expecting probably two to three weeks once it's on the ground to get it cleaned up. Thank you. Um, on the sewer side of things, uh, our contracts have been signed uh, for our Appleton Force Main extension project, uh, phase two if you will, or, or the second go round. And we've got a pre-construction meeting uh, for that project scheduled on Wednesday, August 18th. Okay, uh, B, uh, well, number four update. Oh, I'm sorry. I just had a quick, go ahead. Just had a really quick question for Brent going sure. back to the lease building. So will the park, Bob's Park be closed down during all of that as well? The anticipation is not because the part that we're taking down is only the first phase of the building, which is down towards the area um, from Caswell to Nebraska. So that section uh, probably will not be. Okay. Anything, anything else for Brent? Okay. Item B, Brent, well number four update. Well number four update on your desk tonight uh, with the PDC emblem. I got our results this morning uh, on our PFAS testing for well four and unfortunately we did not pass. Um, if you look at the page three of seven at the very top, the PFOA came back at 3.0 and the PFOS came back at 2.4. Uh, 
Uh, as you may recall, the federal number uh, limit number is seven parts per trillion, and the state's recommendation at this point is two parts per trillion. So well three had a higher count than well four, uh, but still well four is in exceedance of the state's recommendation. So at this point, I have a preliminary proposal scope of work from Strand and Associates to do some cost analysis for us on possible treatments for wells three and four, what those treatments would look like, what kind of footprint's gonna be needed, what kind of operational costs would be associated with those, and look at the life of the well and what the ex expectancy is for the next 20 years. My guess is that's gonna probably tell us that we're probably better off investing in a new well. So we'll be looking and having that discussion as well. So uh, we are meeting tomorrow to go over that scope of work and begin those discussions. So hopefully by next month's public works meeting, I'll have some direction for us uh, on where we're gonna go on the well side. As far as well five goes, uh, that was approved by council to do that work and uh, they are supposed to be starting that work uh, this week. So okay. hopefully that progresses quickly. Okay. Any questions from Brent regarding that? Alderwoman Frank? Brent, is uh, well number three, or well number four, is that uh, North Main? Correct. And then did you say that once it starts to run, it helps get rid of the PFAS? No. Okay. You have to treat because it. I know it was running for weeks and weeks. The water. We ran it. We ran, we ran it that way to keep the uh, biological content as down as low as we could uh, before we tested. Now that we got the test back for the PFAS, um, um, it's, it's not related to the the biological, but the biological was uh, for the additional work that we we're going to be doing. But now that we're we're with the PFAS test result, we've shut it off, and it'll be off until we uh, come to a conclusion on what we're going to how we're going to move forward with that well. Okay, thank you. I misunderstood. Okay. Welcome. Anybody else? Okay. You're none. Uh, item C, the Fifth Avenue project, uh, property acquisition. Right. Uh, we had our appraisal back for the Franklin uh, Display Group property on, for our Fifth Avenue project, storm sewer overflow project, and that information has been shared with the property owner. I was hoping to have a response back in time for this meeting tonight, but I have not got that response back from them as yet. So we'll keep council posted. Hopefully maybe by the next committee meeting, I'll have uh, further information for council's consideration on that portion of that project. Okay. Information pending. Thank you, Brent. Do you have anything else? That's all I got. Thank you. Item three, building planning zoning unfinished business. We have none. Uh, item four, building planning zoning new business. Planning zoning, Gina. So not a lot of active cases right now. Uh, July is a good example of just because there's not a lot of cases being presented to plan commission city council does not mean staff is not busy. Uh, July was definitely a month of meetings with developers and possible applicants both large and small um, getting them ready to submit. So I'd expect the next uh, three to four months to be a, a constant heavy agenda for plan commission. Um, yay. <laughs> So, but right now, um, going to plan commission tomorrow is a special use for a strip mall going next to the ultimate car wash. Uh, there was the two houses, they came down, um, the applicant platted it into one lot, then COVID hit and the whole project stalled. He's now getting ready to move forward with that. So it'll be a strip mall uh, with uh, special use for video gaming and a drive through lane for some kind of food establishment, which should tie in nicely with the car wash next door because they're there for about a half hour. It's perfect to, to walk over and grab something. Um, the other application is for an extra tall flagpole at Kunis. So neither one of them are very controversial. Um, there was supposed to be discussion for development at the corner of uh, Genoa and Crystal. Um, that has been delayed till next month. So I will go over the details then. A um, couple site plans coming in. The one on Indy Drive, it was um, a trucking company that's in the county right now on Newburgh, bought property on Indy because um, he's looking to expand. He's been delayed because he's had a hard time getting 
um, materials that he needs. Um, but he's starting to renovate the building now. His next phase would be to get a special <coughs> use for the truck lot that would go on. Um, zoning letters are still pretty active. Historic Preservation has the two new members and they are starting to move forward with their awards program in October. Um, I have my first hometown Christmas meeting in a couple of weeks. That's, you know, kicking off. Uh, strolls are still going strong and staff is just getting ready to uh, be at the Boone County Fair all week helping out there, so. Okay, and uh, thank you, Gina. Then with the council, I have uh, tried to schedule meetings one-on-one -on -one with as many aldermen as I can get and I think I just have a couple that are that I'm going to work on. I think uh, Alderman Snow and I are going to meet on Wednesday and uh, Alderwoman Mohal and I will meet uh, hopefully this week and I believe that's all that uh, that's all that encompasses all the aldermen uh, alderwomen until um, until we're able to dot the I's and cross the T's if we can and then we'll bring uh, something back but I think uh, in order to keep uh, the aldermen, alderwomen well aware of where we're at. I think it's uh, important that we just sit down a little bit and so there are no surprises later on and tell them what our expectations are and get some feedback from the aldermen. So we'll finish that off this week and uh, hopefully we'll move forward with that. Uh, Gina, is that all you had? Uh, that I can disclose, yeah. Thank you. Uh, item B, Building Department. Kip? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, for the month of July, we issued 94 permits, 12 of which were commercial, 82 were residential. Um, property maintenance-wise, we have 31 open right now, 17 were able to be closed. Um, I, notably, some projects we can talk about. Um, Mr. Pathan from, if anybody knows, Echo Spine out off of Beaver Valley Road. He built a five unit condo and a three unit condo, never finished the three units. He's actually um, going to finish those three units now and plans on continuing development around that circle out there. Um, I talked to Mr. Gunstein today about the car wash. He is anxious to get going. So hopefully, Building plans will be submitted this week. I know the engineering has been approved for quite some time. And then um, uh, some closed cases, KFC had a weed problem. We got that taken care of and uh, Mr. Gunstein's property has been cleaned up. I'll entertain any questions. Anybody? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Kip. Uh, item five under other. Uh, Chief Woody, a request to outfit Belvedere Police Cougar Mine Resistant Ambush Protection, MRAP. Chief? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Sergeant Washburn. He's in charge of our uh, SWAT team. Uh, he uh, will be uh, assisting me with answering any questions that there may be after I'm done with the motion. Thank you. Um, Belvedere Police Department was awarded an armored uh, tactical multi-purpose response and rescue vehicle to the Illinois Law Enforcement Support Office, otherwise known as LESO, which provides surplus equipment to law enforcement agencies throughout the state. SWAT team has been operating without any type of armored rescue vehicle since its inception. The need for this type of equipment is further explained on the document attached to this motion. I've been working with LESO for the last three years to try and get an armored rescue vehicle. I have also researched the cost to purchase an armored rescue vehicle commercially, and based off that research, a commercially purchased armored rescue vehicle would cost anywhere between $180,000 to $250,000, depending on options. In contrast, we were able to get the above Cougar Mine Resistant Ambush Protection, otherwise known as an MRAP, which has an estimated cost of $750,000 provided to the Belvedere Police Department by LESO. There will be costs associated with this vehicle for upfitting equipment and modifications, which will be outlined in the attached document. I will request a motion to approve the expenditure to SWAT mod for the necessary modifications, equipment, and upfitting in the amount of $76,219. This expenditure will be taken from the Belvedere Police Department Federal Asset Forfeiture Account. Okay. We have a motion to that effect. Alderman Fleury, do we have a second? 
Second, Alderwoman Mohal. Discussion? Alderwoman Frank? Um, could you tell me what would we use that for? I know the county has one and I see it during fair or during parades and stuff, but when would we use that? No, the, the county, uh, Boone County actually does not have one. Um, this is a, uh, uh, an armored vehicle that we would use for barricaded situations, active shooter situations, uh, but uh, it's not just uh, uh, tactical applications either. Uh, we could use it for tornadoes where we could traverse uh, terrain uh, that uh, maybe normal uh, first responder vehicles couldn't get to, to victims in certain areas. Uh, we could use it to, to rescue victims that uh, might be trapped somewhere uh, through uh, high levels of water that normal vehicles couldn't get through, uh, different things like that. No, that this would be the first one for Boone County, and that, uh, that's why it's uh, uh, such a necessity. Continue. Would we uh, share that with Boone County then? Uh, we have a uh, multi-jurisdictional SWAT team, so yeah, we both would use it. I if they needed uh, to use that vehicle, absolutely. Um, well, we would, uh, you know, uh, assist them with that. Uh, they have uh, equipment that they've uh, uh, let us use during, you know, situations like barricaded subjects, like the drone that they have. Uh, you know, they not only let us use the equipment, but the personnel. Uh, I feel just being good partners uh, in the county, we would do the same thing. I have a whole bunch more questions, but I'm going to wait and see if anybody else asks them. Okay, we'll get back to you. Thank you, Alderman Frank. Alderman Porter. Okay, Chief, um, a couple questions here. One, I'm assuming that this does not fall under that category of where the state, I think it was, state of Illinois, said we can't buy military equipment or police. Maybe it was a national law. I'm trying to think here. But anyway, they said that you can't have military equipment. And also, the second question I would have is, I remember seeing something in here about that we would let, like, Winnebago County use it if they needed it. Is there any chance of getting them to maybe contribute to part of the um, cost of this outfitting? No. Um, that particular section addresses if Winnebago uh, had an incident and for whatever reason needed to uh, use um, our armored vehicle. Our SWAT team would be deployed with that armored vehicle because it would be a tactical situation. Uh, Winnebago has their own, uh, and they also have access to uh, Rockford Police Departments as well. So this would be something that uh, uh, we would uh, accompany the armored vehicle. So it would be a very limited basis, uh, like I said, because Winnebago does uh, equip their own team with at least one, if not two. No, actually, uh, state statute only prohibits tracked armored vehicles, weaponized aircraft, vessels, or vehicle, which this is not, uh, 50 caliber or higher firearms or ammunition, and then bayonets. Okay. Alderwoman Prather, my right, my right eye vision isn't very good. <laughs> Bear <laughs> with me. Fine. Thank you. It's fine. So my question is for Chief. Um, can you comment as to what the federal asset forfeiture account is? Yes. Um, federal asset forfeiture uh, monies come from seized uh, drug assets. Uh, as some, if not all of you may uh, know, we have a task force officer that's assigned to the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, and when they conduct narcotics investigations mm -hmm. and then seize assets, whether it be monies, uh, vehicles or other properties that uh, have value. Uh, that either gets auctioned and distributed to the agencies that are involved. Uh, so we do get distribution of that. And that money goes into a federal asset forfeiture account, which uh, the uh, uh, federal government uh, regulates how that money can be spent. So basically, this isn't taxpayer funded money at all. This is coming completely from the federal government. It's actually coming completely from uh, drug dealers. One more question. So you'd mentioned that other counties actually already have these sorts of vehicles. So is it true to say that we're just kind of catching up to the trend in equipping our SWAT team? Uh, all of the SWAT teams in the region uh, that I'm aware of have one. Thank you, that's all. 
Alderman Porter. Uh, one other question I thought of here. Okay, so the it sounds like all of the money for this, the initial part of this is going to come from um, drug forfeitures, which is good. It's not going to be taxpayer dollars. Uh, what about the upkeep and maintenance for the, it says a projected lifespan of 10 to 15 years. Uh, do you have any idea at all what it would cost to maintain this kind of vehicle? Well, and that's one of the unique things about this particular MRAP, because there are a lot of different uh, MRAPs out there. Uh, that the military has acquired. Uh, this particular one has a Caterpillar engine, which uh, I'm not an engine guy, but uh, uh, according to uh, those who are, Caterpillar is a very common end diesel engine that can be uh, worked on by uh, virtually any diesel mechanic. Uh, in terms of uh, the transmission, uh, again, my understanding is it's a, it's a fairly universal transmission. Um, the actual cost uh, of maintenance and upkeep. I don't have a dollar figure for you at, at this point, uh, but uh, the, my goal and intent would be to continue to fund this vehicle through asset forfeiture um, in preparation for uh, some sort of armored vehicle. Um, this is something that I recognized we needed a long time ago and um, have been uh, purposely not spending asset forfeiture funds because I wasn't sure that the state would come through and provide one uh, through the lesso program so the alternative would be looking at a commercially commercially purchased one uh, which uh, as you can see would probably be in excess of uh, about another hundred and fifty thousand dollars so uh, we have funds in reserve to uh, fund this purchase uh, uh, probably for the next 10 to 15 years. Okay. Alderwoman Frank. Okay, so you really don't need taxpayer money for this. You're just wanting us to go through the formality of approving it? Correct. Okay. Then the next question, where would we store this since we are at a shortage for storage? I, I appreciate the question and would... Uh, respectfully request not to answer that just because we wouldn't want the general public to know i'd be more than happy to uh, uh, let you know uh, outside of council chambers if that's okay with the mayor is i don't need to know i was just making sure that we had a place yeah i thought you were taking it home <laughs> um so when i had anybody else g40 Uh, just a comment. I just want to say uh, thank you, Chief, for uh, kind of having the foresight to, you know, provide the police department with the proper equipment. I know they've been doing without it for this quite some time, uh, just having that kind of foresight. And then also, you know, giving us that detailed memo that answers a lot of questions why it's important to the department and also showing, you know, the costs if we had to purchase it outright, you know, where we can save from that. And ultimately, it's not costing the taxpayers any money. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Alderman Brereton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, another question for the Chief. Uh, Chief, um, I could be mistaken, but I'm assuming Alderman Frank's thinking of the Hummer, possibly. Um, is, is I guess, um, does this vehicle duplicate the Hummer services, or is the main difference is that it's armored? Uh, yeah, that's a significant difference, because uh, the, the Humvees uh, essentially uh, would be as penetrable as our squad cars would be, which uh, wouldn't pr provide much ballistic protection to any of our uh, SWAT team members or officers. So, uh, yes, the uh, armor capabilities that this vehicle has uh, is sig a significant difference, yes. Um, and I'm just curious, what do we use the Hummer for now, currently? Uh, at this point, it, the uh, white Hummer... Typically, it's for parades, uh, but we do have a uh, SWAT personnel and equipment uh, carrying Hummer uh, assigned to the SWAT team as well. Thank you. Anything else? Um, I would like to say that, um, you know, I had read your uh, memo, Chief, and uh, I was impressed with um, all the things, uh, all the reasoning behind it uh, that you'd put in here. It seems like everything from uh, natural disasters, obviously, uh, violent crime, uh, mass shootings, 
um, and the list goes on and on, but also the critical infrastructure that you list. Um, you list a variety of uh, not only schools, uh, our, um, you know, Stellantis assembly plant, uh, General Mills, um, but also when you consider, the, or at least when I considered this and after I'd read it, um, to me, it's, it's one of those things, it's like insurance. You buy it, and if you need it, then you have it. And I think that's how I looked at it. Um, and I thought it was uh, extremely informative. Um, it did not cost <clears throat> the taxpayers of Belvedere any money, and it will uh, be paid for by those that uh, had broke the law with, uh, in one way or another. Um, but I also was wondering um, if uh, S Sergeant Washburn, if you had anything you wanted to add or if you wanted to go through with the, uh, to show the uh, PowerPoint or, or not. I didn't want to cut this off before he had taken the time to come here tonight. Yeah, if that's okay. Well, if that's okay with you, Mayor, uh, I think uh, the council would find it informative. Uh, so if uh, uh, you don't mind, Sergeant Washburn would like to uh, go ahead and just kind of explain what, uh, what you'd be seeing. First one first, Chris. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, do the, the M995. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, so what the Chief asked me to kind of give as a visual representation is uh, this vehicle first and uh, you know, primarily is a vehicle of, of refuge and rescue for not only members of the community, but for our officers. So what I did was uh, just kind of, I, I, I picked a couple of videos. They were not hard to find out there. And what this first video that we're gonna show is the level of threat. Um, so this is going to be a, a uh, 5.56 or 223 uh, rifle round, very, uh, widely spread throughout our community as well as everywhere else. This is the AR-15 variant that I'm sure everybody's heard of it at the very least. And, and in this first video, what you're gonna see is, is this gentleman in this video is going to fire a uh, 5.56 round at an armor plate. Now this armor plate is, the reason why I picked this one is this is exactly like the enhanced armor that we offer each of our patrol officers. So this is a level three hard armor. Uh, so just for information, just understand that the soft body armor that police officers wear every day does, has zero protection against rifle rounds. Those, those ballistic vests are meant for handgun threats. But uh, I, I'm sure, as you know now, the, the danger is faced by law enforcement for uh, rifle threats. And what you'll see here is he's going to go ahead and fire this round at this uh, ballistic plate. Velocity 2433. We'll go see what we did, folks. This should be pretty self-explanatory since there's only one shot in here. Here was our seven and a half inch shot right here. Really far in from the plate. It's a steel plate, so it does a pretty good job of providing full edge-to-edge -edge coverage. Let me get my straps off here. Place your bets in the comments below. Oh, Raggy, there is a penetration right there in our plate. So that means we don't need to go to the 10 and a half inch because we know the seven and a half inch will penetrate. That is the equivalent to at least, I think, two or 300 yards out. So that's pretty amazing that M995 can do that. So what I wanna do now is I think we'll put a piece of level 3A soft armor behind it, but based on how that's a clean hole, I'm pretty sure it's still gonna penetrate. All right, we've added a level 3A backer to our plate. It's a rhyme leak from AR500 Armor. It's a 100% aramid fiber. We'll take another shot from the seven and a half inch and see if the fiber level 3A can stop it. Let's go see what we did. 
Here is our second shot right here. We are more than two inches away from that previous shot. That is considered a fair hit. I don't have much faith in this combination stopping that boat. We shall see. As expected, there is our pass through right there. This was a brand new panel. Here was our shot right there. And uh oh, raggy. There is a clean, very nice hole through there. There's the back. Thanks, Mike. You can stop there. that one. So, just uh, for information purposes, so what you're looking at there was not only was he uh, firing that rifle round at a hard armor plate, uh, but he had a level 3A soft body armor panel behind it. So, that would be the equivalent of one of our police officers not only wearing their soft body armor, but also wearing the enhanced armor that, that we issued to each of them. Uh, and as you saw, that, that rifle round penetrated right through both of them. So, significantly, this next video is. Uh, in this video, he's going to fire the same M995 uh, rifle round, 5.56 caliber uh, rifle round, at a six-wheel version of the um, Force Protection Incorporated um, vehicle that we're getting. So the vehicle that he's shooting at has the exact same armor because this is just the six-wheel version of the vehicle that we're getting. So he's firing that same rifle round. Go ahead, Mike. Go. You can just take it to the end, Mike. Yes. You want her to the strike? Okay, my first three were the uh, 556 AP. They did penetrate some, but I could see pieces of bullet jacket in two of the holes. Next up, 7.62.51. You can see part of the bullet still in each of the holes. That's good, Mike. You can stop it there. Next so up, significantly, uh, what it's just showing is that even with the body armor that our officers wear every day, you know, unfortunately, police officers' bodies are woefully ineffective at stopping enhanced threats, which is all too real of a, uh, of a situation that we face today. Um, and this vehicle will protect our officers. But again, you know, we, we look at this vehicle as, as a vehicle of refuge and rescue, and it's, and it's as important for us to shelter and care for the uh, citizens of our community that may be at risk from these same threats that we're out there facing. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Washburn. Mr. Mayor. Chief. Thank you. I'd just uh, like to address uh, some question that may be in uh, any of the uh, older uh, men or women's minds of what this vehicle would be uh, used for when it's not uh, assigned to a specific mission. My intent would be that this is a mission-specific vehicle, would not be a parade vehicle, would not be used for anything other than uh, some of those uh, events that we have described in, in, in the outline uh, justifying uh, the need for it to begin with. So uh, this is not something that we would want out on the street unless absolutely necessary. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions? Hearing none, uh, then we have a motion on the floor to approve the expenditure to SWAT mod for the necessary modifications, equipment, and upfitting in the amount of $76,219. This expenditure will be taken from the Belvedere Police Department Federal Asset Forfeiture Account. Um, all those, let's do a roll call. All those uh, in favor? Uh, when called, signifies by saying aye. Any opposed, nay? Frank? Aye. McGee? Aye. Mahal? Aye. Porter? Aye. Prather? Aye. 
Snow? Aye. Stevens? Aye. Brereton? Aye. Flurry? Aye. Nine in favor? Thank you. Uh, Chief uh, Item B, the Rock Valley College Intergovernmental Agreement. Thank you, Sergeant Washburn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, attached is a copy of the IGA or Intergovernmental Agreement uh, between the City of Belvedere and Community College District 511, uh, otherwise known as Rock Valley College, pertaining to the college campus at 1400 Big Thunder Boulevard, Belvedere, Illinois, also known as the Rock Valley College Advanced Technology Center or ATC. The purpose of this agreement is to define the operational responsibilities and working relationships between the Belvedere Police and RVC Police. This IGA has been presented and approved by the Board of Trustees of Rock Valley College. I would request a uh, motion to authorize the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Belvedere Police Department and Community College District 511 uh, DBA or doing business as Rock Valley College. Okay, we have a uh, motion by Alderman Snow. Do we have a second? Second by Alderwoman Mohal. Uh, discussion? Alderman Snow, then Alderman Porter, and Alderwoman Mohal. So, Chief, out of curiosity, do we know, um, I'm assuming they're going to have somebody at the facility during class times. Will they have anybody on patrolling the area or just periodically coming over from the other campus to patrol it? Um, and so night time would kind of fall on us anyhow, regardless? Yeah, according to... Uh, uh, Chief Jenks, uh, he said that uh, as long as personnel allow, he's going to have somebody assigned uh, during school hours. And uh, then um, the only time that nobody would be there uh, and would uh, uh, be necessary for the Belvedere Police to patrol would be between uh, uh, 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. Okay. Alderman Porter. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I'm going to have to abstain from any discussion on this one and, and vote just due to a, a possible conflict of interest. Yes, yes, they, they, they will have jurisdiction outside if they come across uh, a, uh, a crime in progress or an accident, things of that nature. Um, what they have done in Winnebago is uh, they can act as the initial responding officer, but will ultimately turn it over to uh, the jurisdiction that is responsible for that area. Alderman Fleury, do you have a question? No, okay. Anybody else? Okay. Hearing none, we have a motion and a second on the floor for authorized intergovernmental agreement between the City of Belvedere Police Department and Community College District 511 uh, doing business as Rock Valley College. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. And uh, Chief uh, Item C, the uh, acceptance of uh, camera grant. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council, Belvedere Police Department submitted for a grant from the Illinois Training and Standards Board requesting reimbursement for body camera equipment. That grant was approved by the State of Illinois. Attached is a copy of a check from the State of Illinois Treasurer's Office for the amount of $33,325. I would request a motion to authorize the acceptance of the Illinois Training and Standards Board camera grant award in the amount of $33,325. Okay, do we have motion by Alderwoman Mulhall, second by Alderwoman Frank. Uh, any discussion? Any comment? Um, Chief, was this um, the grant that uh, Alderwoman Freeman had, uh, had asked about or had actually suggested um, to, the, to you or to the department? Yes, it is, sir. Okay, with that, well, with that being said, I'd like to... I know she's not here tonight, but I would like to recognize her. I, you know, that's a significant amount of money, and um, 
So I appreciate it, uh, Alderwoman Freeman. I don't know if she's listening. She probably isn't, but I thought it was important to recognize her. So, okay. Uh, okay, so we have the, the motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. Seeing we have no more business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Alderwoman Frank. Second by Alderwoman Prather. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? For the record, uh, we adjourned at 7.01 p.m. Thank you, everybody.